Okay. Um, so uh, thanks to the organizers for the invitation. It's uh, it's really nice to be here, uh, and especially for us, you know. Um, so a number of years ago, I was uh, in Bloomington uh, giving a talk, and uh, you know that was the first and only time that uh, somebody sent a, an actual limousine with a driver to receive me from the airport. <laughs> so <laughs> you know, very elegant. You know, usually I have this. <laughs> This, you know, inelegant yellow cab drivers, you know. Um, Since then you were offended when you go to countries. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Uh, so, so, as we know, you know, there are many uh, ways of proving upper bounds and fluctuations, uh, uh, you know, the whole subject of concentration of measure. Uh, but... Um, you know, very few methods for lower bounds. So as far as I know, these are the only ones. Uh, either you prove distributional convergence, you prove you know, some kind of central limit theorem. So of course that settles the issue. Or you prove a lower bound on the variance and a matching upper bound on a higher moment. So this, for example, there's this paper of Eisenman and Ware, uh, where uh, this was done for the uh, free energy of the, um, of the random field icing model. Um, so once you have this, then you can get an actual um, fluctuation bound. Um, now, so incidentally, if you, if you don't have a matching upper bound, if you just have a lower bound on the variance, you don't um, have any information about the order of fluctuations. Um, there is a method of Swante Janssen. Uh, it's not, you know, if, if you didn't uh, hear about it, it's, it's because it's not very well known. There is, as far as I know, only one application, but um, it's kind of related to what I'm going to talk about. So, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's potentially a general method. And then there are problem-specific uh, methods for proving <laughs> fluctuations. So one that is relevant for this talk is this uh, paper by Pimentel and Paris, which I'm going to talk about. Um, and there are many open questions, actually. Uh, you know, when I uh, had so so actually this um, work started from a question that Yuval asked me um, uh, last year, um, which I'm going to also tell you later. But and when I started looking, I saw that you know there are many problems in which lower bounds on, uh, on fluctuations are not known, um, and uh, and there, none of these approaches work. And sure, but you're not mentioning you know, generally upper bounds for, for for Fourier transform gives you some. Yeah. Yes. 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 That that is that is true. Um, um, yeah, upper bounds on Fourier transforms. Yes. Um, exactly. Um, so, uh, so I'll, I'll introduce this new method, which uh, gives uh, these results for several problems, and I'm, you know, I'll do as much as I can, uh, whatever time I have, without you know losing everybody. Um, so, so let me just talk about what what is you know. How can you how can you get a lower bound on fluctuations? If if a variance lower bound doesn't give you that, what what gives you that? Yeah. So what do you mean when you say lower bound for fluctuations? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So yeah, okay. Um, so uh, so let's see. Um, the Levy concentration function of a random variable uh, is defined as follows. So you're you given a random variable x, and you look at some uh, you know positive uh, real number h. And you look at the chance that x belongs to an interval of uh, length h, and you take supreme over all intervals. And that's called the Levy concentration function of a, of a random variable. And we'll say that a sequence of random variables xn has fluctuations of order at least delta n. So xn is a sequence of random variables. Delta n is a sequence of numbers, uh, presumably you know, going to 0. or you know, It doesn't have to go to 0. But um, if, if there is some positive c so that the Levy concentration function of uh, Xn, which is Fn, um, as at c delta n, the limb soup is strictly less than one. Okay, so that that is is a can be a definition of uh, fluctuations of order at least delta n. So um, so there is some constant c, so that um, if you take any interval of uh, length c delta n, the chance that Xn belongs to uh, that interval, um, you cannot send it to one. Okay, so if you look at the uh, the negation of this statement, you know it it means that uh, you know, you can, you can, you know, Fn of uh, C delta n will tend to delta 1. So, you know, you can have intervals of length, little of delta n, which puts mass closer and closer to 1. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so here's the main lemma, and uh, I'll show you the proof in the next slide. It's very simple. Um, so <clears throat> let x and y be uh, two random variables defined on the same probability space. And then for any two numbers a and b, the chance that x lies between a and b can be bounded by something, uh, which is one half times one plus the probability that x minus y less than this difference b minus a, plus the total variation distance between the law of x and the law of y. So which, um, you know, if uh, somebody here is not familiar with the total variation distance, it means, you know, if you have two probability measures p and q, you take p a minus q a and supreme over all a, and that's the total variation distance, okay? So, so what you do, um, so the idea is the following. To show that probability x belongs to some interval i is uniformly bounded away from one for all intervals i of length less than delta. What you do is a construct a random variable y such that, first of all, the total variation distance is small. And second, the chance that x minus y less than delta is small. So x minus y are apart by a certain amount, and yet the total variation distance is, is small. So if you can ensure these two things, then you have a uniform upper bound. You can show that these, this probability is bounded away from one. So th that's what you want to show, that the probability is bounded away from one uh, for, for any interval of length delta. So uh, what Swanti Janssen did is a similar approach, but um, what uh, he does is he, he takes y such that the law of x equals the law of y. Somehow, you know, that's what it boils down to. It's not exactly uh, written in that way, but, um, but that, uh, that makes it much more difficult to apply because then you have to construct two random variables which have exactly the same distribution, but they're kind of guaranteed to be um, far apart by at least delta, okay? So that, that is harder. It's more flexible to have this total variation distance uh, between, and we'll see why, you know, uh, so, so there are uh, reasons why uh, this um, allows much more flexibility, okay? So any questions about this lemma before I go into this one page proof of this, or in? Uh, yes, uh, but then, uh, you know, um, then you then you have to know what you're trying to prove. So you want to prove that, you know, x is not concentrated in a small interval. So you, you have you construct y so that it is repelled from x. So it's guaranteed to be away from x by a certain amount. Okay. Using the total variation bound, then you could couple if you were copying of x. Right? So what? I mean, no. you could, using the assumptions, you can get Jensen's somehow from the first approach. You can get Jensen's approach by. Uh, I guess so. Uh, uh, yeah, I didn't. I didn't think about that. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So here's a here's a you know a little proof. So let I denote the interval a b. Uh, you note that one is bigger than or equal to the probability that x belongs to i or y belongs to i which by inclusion exclusion, it's this, probability x belongs to i plus probability y belongs to i minus the probability of the intersection. Now, probability y belongs to i is at least probability x belongs to i minus the total variation distance by the definition of the total variation distance. And this is, uh, this intersection probability is bounded by the probability that x minus y less than b minus a because if both of them belong to the same interval, the difference is bounded uh, by b minus a. And therefore, if you put it together, you get this inequality, which is just the inequality that I wrote down. Okay. 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 So, um, so a very simple example. Suppose you have x1 to xn iid Bernoulli random variables, and sn is a sum, and we all know what, what this is. Um, and you want to show that it has fluctuations of order at least root n without proving the CLT. You know, without proving the central limit theorem, just a soft argument to show that um, you know, it has fluctuations of order at least root n. So what you do is uh, you, you uh, take each i and with a small probability like one over root n, you change it to one. You, with, uh, otherwise you keep it the same, but with a small one over root n probability, you change it to one. So you increase some of the x size. Now, you can do a direct calculation in this case, and you can show that total variation distance, so this is one reason why total variation distance is very nice, because uh, if you have the same function of two random vectors, then total variation distance between the law of the two more complicated objects, this S and S and prime, is bounded by total variation distance between the laws of uh, these original vectors, okay? And th this, the, the middle term here, 
uh, this is easy to compute. Uh, you know, it's just uh, independent random variables. You can write down, write it down, do the exercise, and you show that although you're changing a lot of the size, you know, you're changing roughly root n of the size to one, okay, the total variation distance is still bounded by a constant times this alpha, which is a parameter that we'll choose later. So that's a, you know, nice little thing, and there is a general reason why that's true. So even if you're, even though you're doing a lot, uh, uh, a lot of changes, it, it, the total variation distance is not much. But on the other hand, Sn increases by at least root n, okay? Because you're changing root n of these two ones. So at least half of those were minus one to begin with, or zero to begin with. So, so you're changing root n of them to one, and you're increasing every xi. So, so this happens with high probability. And therefore, if you take uh, an interval of root, root n times some small enough constant, um, then the lemma will tell you that the probability that Sn belongs to this interval is at most a half times one plus the total variation distance, which, is, which can be made small enough by choosing alpha small, and this probability that the difference is bounded by delta n, which can be made, again, small enough uh, by choosing uh, you know, this constant small. And this will tell you that the probability that for, for some, if, you, if you take uh, some constant times root n, length interval where the constant is small enough, it will show that the probability Sn belongs to the interval is bounded strictly, you know, bounded away from one. It's not, it can. The one case where all the methods you mentioned at the beginning can, can work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But this one does, but, but also direct calculation. Yeah. And, so, yeah, how, yeah. is this supposed to be simpler than the direct calculation? Except the middle example. Sorry. Previous slide, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, so what I'll do now is I'll do the uh, I'll get an optimal lower bound for the traveling salesman problem. Okay. So that's you know I think you will agree that's harder. Um, so. Um, so there is this concept of Hellinger affinity. So if you have two probability measures, mu and mu prime, uh, which have densities f and g with respect to some probability measure mu and nu, which you can always find, just take the average of mu and mu prime. The Hellinger affinity is defined as the integral of square root fg times d nu. Okay. So, um, and actually this quantity doesn't depend on choice of nu. As long as mu and mu prime are both absolutely continuous with respect to nu, that's fine. Now, uh, here is the nice, a nice connection between total variation distance and Hellinger affinity. So suppose you have uh, you know, these probability measures on some space, mu1 to mu n and mu1 prime to mu n prime, and look at these product measures, mu1 cross up to mu n and mu1 prime cross up to mu, mu n prime. Then there is a well-known bound on total variation distance between the product measures in terms of the Hellinger affinities between the components. So, if you take the Hellinger affinity of mu y, mu y prime, square it, take the product from i equals one to n, one minus the product, square root, that's an upper bound in total variation distance. And that's, uh, that has been used before by statisticians, um, you know, um, and others uh, as, a, as a convenient way of um, getting bounds on total variation distances between product, product measures in terms of, you know, this very simple, uh, you know, Hellinger affinities between the individual components. Okay. So this is what helps us with the total variation distance. The next component, uh, any question? The next component is, is this uh, little perturbation. So you have, so I'll work with functions of independent variables and we saw one kind of perturbation. If you have Bernoulli variables, you change zero to one uh, with some small probability. Uh, if you have continuous variables, then you can do something um, which is maybe even simpler, um, which is just uh, multiplying by a small factor. So suppose x is a d-dimensional random vector with a probability density function e to the minus v. And here is v is some smooth function satisfying some growth conditions. Um, so it has to be smooth, it, uh, you know, either zero, rd to the, or zero infinity to the d, it cannot be uniform. Um, and then you, what you do is you scale x by a factor one plus epsilon, let's say, and you get y, and you ask what's the total variation, what's the Hellinger affinity of x and y? So then, uh, you know, you write down the Hellinger affinity, you write down the product of the square roots of the densities. And, you know, this is the, you know, ugliest thing that you will see in this talk, and it's not very ugly anyway. 
Uh, what? Uh, y is uh, x over 1 plus epsilon. You just kill it. It's just a scaling. You, you can even multiply by 1 plus epsilon. It's the same, you know. And so, so that's, uh, you write down Hellinger affinity, and then you do, you know, take order epsilon squared out, uh, you know. So uh, you just look at what happens to the, uh, to the expansion in epsilon. And then it's a simple application of, let's say, the divergence theorem or integration by parts that uh, you end up with Ellinger affinity bigger than one minus constant times epsilon squared. So the epsilon cancels out somehow because of the smoothness. If you do uniform random variable, uniform in a square or a disk or anything, this will not be true. But if you, as long as you have a smooth um, density, uh, this, this works, okay? So then what happens? So if you have x1 to xn are iid with some smooth density as above, and yi is a scaling of xi, xi over one plus epsilon i, then total variation distance between the n tuples x1 to xn and y1 to yn is bounded by square root of summation epsilon i squared. So this is, you know, so suppose, so this allows you to scale each of them by one over root n without taking the density distribution, joint distribution too far away. So if you do one over root n to each of them, then summation epsilon i squared becomes one, okay? So, so you see, so that's, that's the advantage of doing this kind of scaling. So I just did the Taylor expansion over there, and uh, in the integral, I applied uh, integration by parts. Okay. So then what, what follows from this? So a very general theorem follows somehow about function, geometric functionals like traveling salesman or minimum matching. So suppose you have n points in RD, and you have a function of those n points, and the function has this kind of homogeneity property that if you take lambda x1 to lambda xn, lambda comes out as lambda to the r. So r is equal to one, um, for instance, for traveling salesman or minimum matching, and if you take, let's say, volume of convex hull, then r is, uh, you know, um, d, where d is the dimension. Um, so lots of complicated functions have this homogeneity property, uh, complicated functions arising in um, this kind of combinatorial problems. And um, let x, x1 to xn be iid random variables. Let's just imagine them as you know, Gaussian points, for, for example. And ln is this function. So if you have a bunch of n Gaussian points, and you look at the length of the minimum spanning, uh, a minimum um, uh, in the traveling salesman path to, uh, to, the, uh, to those points, or you look at the minimum matching, which is you know, take, take pairs and you pair them up so that total distance is minimized, that's minimum matching. Um, any, any function like that. And then here is the theorem. Let Tn be a sequence of constants so that probability liminf, uh, liminf of the probability Tn ln bigger than Tn is positive, which, you know, I'm, I, what I have in mind is Tn is like the median of ln, okay? So Tn is like the median value of ln. Um, then ln is fluctuations of order one over root n times Tn, at least. Okay, so, so any, any geometric functional like this with this homogeneity property, um, if you, if, you have, uh, if you apply that function to a bunch of um, random, uh, random variables um, uh, in random points according to some smooth density, then, the, then that ln will have fluctuations of order n to the minus half times tn at least. So let's see what this gives for the traveling salesman. Uh, but any questions about this slide before that? Okay. Uh, okay, so let, let, me, let me just give you the sketch of the proof. It's, it's just the same as, as before. So what you do is you, t you scale each xi by one over root n, you know, one plus one over, sorry, one plus one over root n. And then um, uh, by the homogeneity property, you know that ln prime, the new traveling salesman path has scaled by one plus one over root n. Um, but if ln is at least tn, which is the median value, uh, then uh, you know, then by this homogeneity property, uh, this difference is at least tn over root n. So there you, you get a difference of at least tn over root n fr from the original path and a new path after the scaling. And by our Hellinger affinity bound, the total variation distance between ln and ln prime is bounded by some constant, which is not growing at n, and there is a parameter which you can adjust, okay? And then you just apply the theorem, and you get your result. So it's tn over root n.
Okay, so let's see what this gives. Yeah, so I'll not go into the details, but it, it's almost the whole proof, you know, just a few details left. Right? Yeah. Choosing alpha small enough. Okay, so, so for instance, a traveling salesman path or the minimum matching, uh, in both cases, if you have n points um, from some nice enough density, in uh, d dimensions, it's known that, that ln is of order uh, n to the 1 minus 1 over d. And the reason is very simple. The reason is that typically two points are away by n to the minus 1 over d. Um, and therefore, uh, in both problems, you, it's like you can lower bound it by sum of nearest neighbor distances. So you get n to the 1 minus 1 over d. So, so the lower bound on fluctuations is at least uh, n to the minus half times n to the 1 minus 1 over d, which is n to the d minus 2 over 2d. And this actually matches an upper bound. Um, it is known using standard techniques that um, there is an upper bound of n to the d minus 2 over 2d for these problems, uh, both minimum matching traveling salesmen. Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the, the, the known upper bound is for bounded density and, and uh, you know, density is compact support. And you know, there is no reason to believe that uh, this is not true for unbounded, but I didn't see it. Um, worked out anywhere um, for, for unbounded densities and unbounded support. Um, what? What did you use in your theorem? No, this is the, this is the uh, oh, in the theorem, uh, I used uh, for these densities. So, so I assume that um, you, the density of the points, oh, the, yeah, the smoothness, this, this the kind condition. of Hellinger affinity, yeah, this thing. But it so could be equal to, or is that constant? Oh, yeah, constant. That's the, that's the right order for d equals to constant. Okay. And the only previous result I know about uh, this class of problems is, um, is due to uh, Rhee, who proved the order one lower bound for traveling salesman through uniformly distributed points at the unit square. So, you know. So, uh, let me stop because when you say the density is at unbounded support, you mean that they really have to have unbounded support or they are allowed to? Uh, no, they, they, they have to have, in, in my theorem, they have to have unbounded support. Well, I mean, why all you needed was the bounded, bound on the derivative. Don't you have a bound function, which seems to need the bound function, that's not good? Ah, uh, yes, that is, that is good, too. Yeah, I, th I think that, that will work. Yeah, th thanks, Yuval. Yeah, didn't, yeah. Yeah, so, so if, you, if you have a C infinity bound function, that will also work. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay. As a slightly more complicated example, this two-dimensional first passage per collision. Okay. So this is the problem that Yuval posed. Um, uh, so, so in case somebody is unfamiliar with the model here, um, so you have the integer lattice Z two. And each edge is assigned a random weight, and the weights are non-negative in IID, random variables. The weight of a path is the sum of the edge weights along the path. And then you take two vertices x and y, and the first passage time txy is the minimum over the weights of all paths from uh, x to y. Okay? So that's the, that's the first passage per collision, ordinary first passage per collision model. And the, there is a, you know, one of the uh, big open questions in this area in this first passage per collision is what's the order of fluctuations of this uh, path? How does it depend on the distance between x and y? How does it grow with the distance between x and y? And uh, just to summarize some known results, the best known upper bound is the distance by the log of the distance, square root, and with the contributions from, with contributions from a lot of people. So Keston proved it without the log and then Benjamin Kala and Schramm with the log but for you know, binary variables which was extended to now. Now, you know, for almost any distribution, we know that. The lower bound, uh, well, you see the upper bound here, it's the distance over the log of the distance square root. The lower bound is much worse. Uh, the lower bound and the variance due to Newman and Pisa is uh, the variance is bounded b below by some constant times the log of the distance. <coughs> However, as I mentioned before, this variance lower bound doesn't prove uh, lower, an actual lower bound on the order of fluctuations because the upper bound doesn't match in this problem and you know, we have no hope at this point of getting a matching thing anytime soon. Um, 
So Pimentel and Perez actually proved a lower bound of order uh, square root of the distance, but only if the weights are exponentially distributed. So, um, so there is this argument. In the paper, which uh, uses uh, um, this, as Yuval was mentioning, the Fourier analytic bound, so they, there is, so, you know, they actually work with the density. Um, and, uh, but this, this uh, what, what Yuval asked is that, you know, this uh, proof is heavily dependent on the exponential distribution and does not seem to easily extend to other distributions. So here is uh, what you can prove. So, um, so if you have some mild smoothness and decay assumption, the weight distribution, uh, then the fluctuations of T X Y Y are at least of order square root log X Y. It doesn't um, improve the the existing uh, um, lower bound, but it uh, it does uh, for you know general weight distributions as a, as an example of this method. And uh, here is how the proof goes. So I'll give. It, so any any questions about the model or the Yes, yes. Yes, so, so you know, in, in, hi in higher dimensions, uh, you, can, um, you can easily pro approve a, an order one lower bound by just looking at the edges coming out of the origin and you can kind of fluctuate them enough yeah. to. So, uh, uh, yeah, but that's the best we can get. You know, I, I don't know of a better lower bound in higher dimensions. So in, in three and higher dimensions, it's completely open to even show that the fluctuations are diverging as the distance There's between. No, no conjecture for the order of magnitude, right, in higher dimensions? No, right, I don't know. Okay, boundedness, is that, is that a consensus on the no, conjecture? I don't think so. Height is B, like it's bound to uh, Oh, no, 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 I don't know. So, uh, so here's a proof sketch. So you take any two points x and y, let n be the distance between x and y. And then what you do is you take a ball of radius n, n over 2 around x, and then you scale the weights. You scale the weight of an edge uh, by a factor epsilon, 1 plus epsilon, where epsilon is now not the same for all edges. What you do is you choose epsilon to be roughly the 1 over the distance of the edge from x times square root log n. You know, so you make that kind of a choice. So you, you scale it by according to a distance. So, um, so that's how you scale it. And then uh, some simple computations will uh, show you that um, once you do the scaling, the, the new first passage time is at least root log n away from the old time. So, so you're scaling everything down, so the new first passage time must decrease. But it decreases by at least root log n. So there is, you can give uh, you know, a lower bound on the amount of decrease. And also, the total variation distance changes by some constant amount, some c alpha. Okay. So you get these two things. You get a certain amount of decrease, root log n decrease, and, uh, you know. Didn't you get the discrete distribution? How did it decrease? Oh, I don't know. Uh, so, so you have to do something else. Like, if you have binary, you can do the same kind of thing that I did uh, as before. Yeah, for the Bernoulli, you can do that. But in more general discrete, one has to think. You know, uh, I was just telling Ron the other day, uh, you know, what one can do, uh, wh which may work is, you know, for Bernoulli, replace by one deterministically. But for general distributions, what may work is uh, you take some x and uh, with some small probability, 1 over root n, or in this case, this kind of probability, you replace it by the maximum of two copies of the, from the same distribution, or the minimum of two copies from the same distribution. That may, that may work. Okay. So, um, so the proof is completed by choosing alpha sufficiently small and applying this lemma. So the lower bound usually is the same. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, so, so this, um, you know, this whole argument. Uh, so, why is t minus t prime at least uh, square root log n, uh, and uh, why is the total version distance at most alpha? It all chooses. Uh, it depends on these weights. And the thing is, I chose these weights uh, kind of not not actually by guessing, uh, but more by an optimization procedure. So, so you write down uh, the total variation bound in terms of these epsilons, and then you write down how much t will decrease depending on these epsilons, and then you can optimize. And so th this root log n is the optimum uh, that you can do, you know. Yeah, so. But in fact, if you use these weights, you will get the, the, the lower bound in any dimension. The problem will be yeah. that the total variation distance will blow up. Okay. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay, uh, another application to first passage per collision. Um, so let bt be the set of all vertices that are reached by time t. So all x to the t0 x is less than or equal to t. So that's the ball of radius t. And there is this, uh, you know, one of the first results in, uh, you know, or one of the early results in um, first passage per collision is that there is a limit shape uh, B0 so that if you scale the set BT by over T, it's contained within one minus epsilon B0, one plus epsilon B0. So it approaches a limit shape, this, uh, this uh, uh, set BT. And B0 is called the limit shape of uh, these, um, and the fluctuations are called the shape fluctuations. And then there is a natural shape fluctuation exponent. So you can, you can take the smallest kappa so that bt is contained in t minus t to the kappa b0 and t, uh, uh, well, contains t minus t to the kappa b0 and is contained in t plus t to the kappa b0 for all large t almost surely. So that's called, uh, that's some exponent that was defined in Newman and Pisa, but it's, it's a very natural exponent when you're talking about the fluctuations of the shape and um, so this was an open problem to actually show that this exponent is strictly positive in any dimension. Okay. Okay, so this is the result that I have. Uh, so I can prove that in 2D first passage per collision under some mild conditions on the edge distribution, the sky prime is at least one eighth. And, um, and then what you do is, is the usual thing. So you show that there is some direction in which the fluctuations of order are off or at least one n to the one eighth and so on. And now Newman and Pisa uh, proved a lower bound for the variance, but um, this does not, since this does not imply a lower bound on the order of fluctuations, uh, you cannot exactly get a lower bound on chi prime. So they get a lower bound on some other exponent, but which is not really a shape fluctuation exponent. So some. Some, some other exponent which involves the variance. But this, this actual exponent, um, uh, this is a new result. Okay. So here you get really a power of n, right? Yeah. Obviously, you only go the square root of log n for the mild These mild conditions exclude the exponential. No, no, no. It, 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 uh, it, uh, it applies to the exponential distribution also. Uh, so, so, so as I said, uh, you know, this distribution, uh, it can, it's a smooth density. Uh, it's a smooth density on either RD or zero infinity to the D. So if you have the positive orthon, that's also fine. So, so if you, if you have a non-negative random variable, which has a smooth density. You don't need no uh, straight edges in the limit shape? Uh, no, no. So it's one direction. There is one direction in which you have large fluctuations. So, you, yeah, so. So if you consider the full shape as a whole, you, you can always do this, yeah. So you, this, uh, this theorem has no assumptions, uh, you know, this. Um. It's conjectured that chi prime is one third. Um, here is another problem, the random assignment problem. So you have n tasks to be assigned to n workers. Uh, yeah. There's no hope to move from this task result to get the power uh, I, don't, I don't think so, because uh, here, what, all that I'm using is that there is some direction in which I can prove the fluctuations of order at least n to the one eighth, which is also a new result, by the way, I think. Um, uh, this, uh, there is some direction in which there, there are fluctuations of order into the, into the, at least n to the one eighth. But that, that, that's, that's just because the limit shape will have some direction in which it's not flat, you know, it has, it has at least some curvature. Yeah, so this, uh, you know. But it looks it's, it's quite close to the other thing. Well, maybe, I don't know. I'll and the problem is, what if the limit shape is flat in the horizontal direction? Which it isn't, but you can't rule it out. Okay, so um, just as long as I have some time. Uh, so, so the random assignment problem, there are n tasks to be assigned to n workers. AIG is the cost of assigning task J to worker I. And the minimum cost is this minimum overall permutation, summation AI pi I. And the random assignment problem is where it is AIG is a non-negative, IID non-negative random variables. And there are 
uh, some famous results about this. So, um, so if f is continuous and uh, if f is the probability density of the idea and continuous and f0 is 1, all this showed that this cost uh, converges to pi squared over 6 in probability, uh, this Messard and Parisi conjecture. And this was generalized uh, and extended by, by other people about the fluctuations of this CN. So, so you see that all this proof that CN itself converges to in probability to a constant. So its fluctuations are going to zero. Uh, now, what are the fluctuations? The best known upper bound is um, one over root n up to some log factors. One over. Yeah, proving, yes. <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't be very elegant. <laughs> so, <laughs> next time just say proving a conjecture. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so the best known um, uh, upper bound uh, is uh, 1 over root n up to some factors, and, and you know, this has not been improved. You know, 1 over root n is the right answer, but it, it has, the upper bound has not been improved. Um, what is the right answer? One. 1 over n should be the right answer. Um, if the AIGs are exponentially distributed, then much more can be done. Uh, so uh, what is known is that uh, with exponentials, the actual asymptotic for the variance is known. Although, again, it does not prove that the fluctuations are act actually of order 1 over root n, but the variance asymptotics are known due to a result of Wasland. And, um, and Wasland told me that uh, you know, he can prove the actual lower bound and fluctuations also, although it's not, not written, but uh, it's, uh, he, can, he can do that for exponentials. But for general uh, cost distributions, um, lower bound is not known, and nothing is known about a lower bound. So here is what you can do using this method. You can show, th show that uh, 1 over root n lower bound using this, this technique. Now, the, this, in this case, it's not so simple. If you just do a multiplicative perturbation, it doesn't work. Because the AIGs that are contributing to the optimal cost, there are only n of them. And you know, most of them are not anywhere near contributing to the optimal cost. So, so you have to do something more complicated. So what you do is you replace AIG by AIG prime, where AIG prime has to solve an equation. Uh, AIG prime has to solve this equation, AIG prime plus alpha 1 over n times phi n of AIG prime is equal to AIG, where phi n is the function, which is not linear. If it was linear, it would be, again, a linear scaling. It's a function which goes up uh, at rate root n up to 1 over n, and then goes up at rate 1. Okay? So, so there is this function which uh, goes up like um, at, with slope root n up to 1 over n, and then goes up with rate 1. And then you have to solve this equation, and then this, um, this thing, if you work it out, you'll see that the total variation distance is bounded and so on. So, so this gives a 1 over root n uh, thing. Um, determinants of random matrices, um, uh, here's a fairly general result about, uh, so let M be a random square matrix of order N, which is a function of IID random variables. So, so the entries need not be independent. Each entry is a function of a bunch of IID random variables. So there are little n random variables and the matrix order is big N. And then you make some assumptions about, uh, um, uh, this, uh, so M is, a, is, a, is homogeneous of degree R as a function of these random variables. Um, then log of the determinant has fluctuations of order at least uh, 1 over root of little n times big N. Okay. And so here's an example. Uh, so suppose uh, X0, uh, X is a, a P by N random matrix with IID entries. X0 is a matrix obtained by subtracting of row mean from each row, and this you compute the sample covariance matrix. So uh, what they do in statistics, you know, what random matrix people do is they just take X transpose, but in statistics is actually you su subtract off the row means and it becomes a bit more complicated. Um, and then it says that log of the determinant has fluctuations of order at least one over root of NP because there are NP random variables uh, acting on, the, uh, you know, uh, involved in this whole thing. And the order of the matrix M is P. So it's 1 over root NP times P, which is square root P over N, which is the right order. So this, this is actually, been, it's, a, it's actually a recent result uh, for this sample covariance matrix. 
that this uh, and the, the, and there is a you know for Gaussian entries they prove a CLT um, when p over n sub, with fluctuations of order root p over n. So again, somehow uh, this thing that I wrote down up there it just gives you the right uh, right result. And finally, this is the final example: um, this free energy of the schoenfeld kirchhoff model. So you have um, these uh, IID normal random variables, um, and you know I'll not go into the the model itself right now, let's just write down the free energy. It's, a, it's just a function of IID normal random variables. It's, uh, you take summation gij sigma i sigma j, beta times root n e to the power of that over, and you take the sum of this quantity over all sigma on the hypercube, and then you take the log of that. That's the free energy. Well, the you know, actual the phases do you know, multiply by one over beta outside and so on, but I'm, I'm, I'll just call this the free energy. And um, for general beta, the best known upper bound uh, is uh, on the variance is n over log n for general beta. Uh, when beta is less than one, um, uh, there is a famous result of Eisenman, Lebowitz, and Ruel who proved that uh, it has, Fn has fluctuations of order one and satisfies the central limit theorem if beta is less than one, okay? Um, so here is what you can do using this method you can show that Fn has fluctuations of order at least one uh, as n tends to infinity for any beta. And, um, you know, I don't know what's the right order uh, of fluctuations of Fn. You know, Talagran told me that, you know, some people say the upper bound is also of order one, but I, I don't know, I'm not, not sure of that. Uh, but in, so the lower bound in this case is not, uh, you know, you know, I, at least I don't know of a simple way to do it, uh, unlike, you know, uh, this uh, higher dimensional first passage per collision where um, you can get order one lower bound fairly easily. I don't know how to get an order one lower bound uh, easily in this, uh, in this problem. So, okay, so here's a bunch of, um, um, you know, open problems. There are lots and lots of open problems. Um, and, um, uh, okay, so happy birthday, Russ. <laughs> <laughs>